The center, also known as the five and the big man, if you will, tends to be the tallest, strongest, and most dominant figure on the court. However, as many of us are aware, the center position has seen a significant amount of change over the course of NBA history. From the beginning of the NBA, where centers such as Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain dominated the league, to where we are right now, where you have players such as DeMarcus Cousins and Joel Embiid, who are one of the more well-known players who play the position. And in today's video, we're going to go through everything else in between. But before we get into the video, let me give a huge shout out to today's sponsors. <laughs> No, I'm just playing. No sponsors for this video. Let's get straight into it and let's discuss the evolution of the center position. Now, obviously, we have to start at the beginning with our forefathers, the players who not only created the blueprint on how the center should dominate, but also created the blueprint on how many of us interpret how the game of basketball should be played at an elite level. Players such as Walt Bellamy, Nate Thurman, Bob Pettit, George Mikan, Bill Russell, and of course, Will Chamberlain. Now, like I alluded to earlier, these are the architects, players who laid the blueprint down and allowed us to understand what it truly means to be a center in the NBA. Certain concepts such as outlet passes, post-ups, boxing out, rebounding, or even something as advanced as retaining possession after blocking a shot are all things that were created by these players. And also their impact reaches beyond the center position. Certain concepts such as the dimensions of the court as the lane was widened not once but twice due to the dominance of George Mikan and then Will Chamberlain. And other fundamentals such as layup drills that George Mikan became famous for are still being utilized by today's NBA stars such as Kyrie Irving. But what's more important is the impact that these players had on their team success, which eventually led to a lot of individual accomplishments. When it comes to MVPs, Bob Pettit received two of them, Will Chamberlain received four, and Bill Russell received five. And then when it comes to championships, Bob Pettit won a ring, Will Chamberlain would go on to win two, George Mikan won four, and famously, Bill Russell won 11. And because of the massive advantage that centers just inherently had over smaller players in the league, as well as their massive amount of impact that was obviously felt with the amount of championships that were being allocated to centers, the narrative was quickly built that the only way that a team could have any substantial amount of success is if they built their identity through the center position. As these giants not only were extremely impactful on the defensive end, but also offensively, since there wasn't a three-point line and the concept of scoring was basically just trying to get the ball as close as you can to the basket before you attempt the shot, it only made sense to orchestrate your offense through the center position. This level of dominance continued to go on throughout the 70s and the early 80s. And a variety of different playing styles from the center position was also introduced into the NBA. Players such as Bob Lanier, Dave Cowens, Moses Malone, Bill Wallen, and of course, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, all had their fair share of success and dominance all throughout this 10 to 15 year stretch. And oh yes, let's not forget about our ABA brethren as well, Dan Issel, Artis Gilmore, and Mel Daniels, all players who shared a level of influence and dominance that again trickled down all the way into today's NBA. And like I said it before, it wasn't just the dominance, but also it was the uniqueness and the various styles of play that was introduced to the NBA thanks to these players. Smaller censors such as Dan Issel, Bob McAdoo, and Wes Unsel, who was listed as 6'7", found various ways to attack the basket by taking slower and bigger centers off the dribble and finishing strong around the rim and making sure that the jump shot was a valuable option even at the center position. Then you had the more defensive oriented centers, players such as Artis Gilmore and Bill Walton. Granted, both of these players, they could put the ball in the basket and score. However, their impact was much greater on the defensive end and really made their mark in league history due to their defensive impacts. And then you had the traditional big body back to the basket centers such as Bob Lanier and Moses Malone, who not only use their size, but also great footwork to attack the basket and really get the defenders off balance. And then obviously you had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar who was just leaps and bounds better than not only majority of these players on his list, but majority of players throughout NBA history because he was just ridiculously dominant. 
And speaking of dominance, the league would continue to be dominated by these big men. During the 70s and the early 80s, there were a plethora of centers who were winning championships, some of which won multiple rings. And then when it comes to MVPs, and I'm pretty sure some of you all may not be aware of this, but throughout the entire 70s, only centers were the recipient of the league's MVP award. The streak was eventually broken by Dr. J in 1981, but picked right back up by Moses Malone after he won back-to-back -back MVPs. And also something that is noteworthy, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar ended his stretch of years with six league MVPs, which for those out there who aren't aware, is the most in NBA history. Which thus brings us to the late 80s and the 90s as well, a stretch of years that many people not only consider the golden age of basketball, but also the golden age of big men. This stretch of years was the perfect marriage of the old and new. Centers such as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Moses Malone, Robert Parrish, who were on the decline but still actively impactful and still seeing a lot of team success as well. While on the other hand, you're introducing some of the greatest centers the NBA has ever seen. Patrick Ewing, Shaquille O'Neal, David Robinson, and Hakeem Olajuwon. And to highlight some of the other centers who constantly get overlooked, simply because, you know, there were so many other great talented centers, you also have players such as Alonzo Mourning, Dikembe Mutombo, Bill Lambeer, Brad Dotry, and if Ralph Sampson stayed healthy, that Houston Rockets team would have been ridiculous. Now, to be honest, I think a huge reason why these centers tend to stand out amongst their peers and predecessors has a lot to do with not only their statistical dominance, but also their charisma as well. You had Kareem with the sky hook, Hakeem with the dream shake, Dikembe Mutombo with the finger wag, Bill Lambeer with, you know, his flagrant fouls, and Shaquille O'Neal with all the shenanigans that he had going on as well. And because this is such a colorful bunch, it tends to allow us to overlook the lack of accolades. And speaking of that, let's go ahead and tackle that real briefly. In light of the fact that, again, I would argue that majority of these players were extremely talented, arguably the most talented in NBA history when you take into consideration the talent and the development and the skill set, they still weren't winning that many accolades whatsoever. Looking back at it, yes, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Robert Parrish, and Bill Lambeer were going to win some more championships towards the late 80s. However, their impact just wasn't the same as it once was in the early 80s and for Kareem in the 70s. And then entering the 90s, the only two centers who led their teams to championships were David Robinson and Akeem Olajuwon. And coincidentally, those are the only two centers who won MVPs during these stretch of years as well. Now, in my opinion, I don't believe this is an indictment on the center position because again I think the skill set and the dominance is almost undeniable however what I do believe occurred was the improvement of the dominance of perimeter players which is extremely interesting because if it wasn't for the introduction of the defensive player of the year award there are a lot of centers whose resumes would have been looking a little suspect Nevertheless, though, the center position was still extremely dominant, and as time continued to progress, it became even harder to defend some of these players, especially in the beginning of the 1970-1998 season when the NBA introduced the restricted area. You know that little half of a circle that's right underneath the basket where people have to be outside of the area to actually set a charge and be called for it? Yeah, that was introduced into the NBA because players were just setting charges wherever they wanted to in the lane in hopes that they can gain some type of advantage of a 280-pound man in Shaq just barreling into the lane. So to prevent players from just flopping all over the place and to make it a little bit easier to referee, the NBA kind of had to introduce a restricted area. However, things would turn for the worse, or at least for the center position. Because see, in the early 2000s, the NBA went through an overhaul of new rules. And I'm not going to go through every single last one because it was a lot. Like, a lot, a lot of rules. But there were some new rules that obviously were going to have a negative effect on the center position. Such as the 5 second back to the basket rule, which gives a 5 second limitation on players trying to back down. Also, you had the new defensive 3 in the key rule which prohibited defensive players from just remaining in the lane for longer than three seconds unless they were actively defending someone. But most importantly, and I would argue the most impactful rule change in NBA history, was the elimination of illegal defense and the reintroduction of zone defense in the NBA. And with these new rule changes, as well as a handful of other rule changes that attempted to eliminate physicality, especially in the low post, from both the offensive and defensive players, NBA teams and their players were forced to make a drastic shift and they were 
expected to do it immediately. Now quickly before I talk about how certain players and teams made their adjustments, let me be clear on why it was so important that teams changed as soon as possible. Going back to the beginning and like I alluded to earlier, the center position traditionally has been the most efficient player on the court, largely due to their massive advantage, which is height. And with there being no three-point line in the early stages of the NBA, and even when the three-point line was introduced into the league and players really not attempting that many threes early on, the center more or less continued to be the most efficient player on the court and the best scoring option. However, when you introduce rules that puts a limitation on how long a player can back down to the basket, or when you introduce zone defense, which allows the opposing defense to shrink on players, especially those in the post, it makes it that much harder for isolation players to score, even those who have a massive height advantage. If you look at some of the more traditional low post centers during the 2000s, except for Shaq, and even some of the power forwards as well, you can clearly see that they weren't consistently shooting above 50% like their predecessors. So how exactly did teams adapt? Some teams no longer utilize a center position as a main scoring option. Because of this, we started to see a lot of centers who offensively were really inept, but had a massive impact on the defensive end, such as Tyson Chandler, Marcus Camby, and of course, Ben Wallace. Unfortunately for most teams though, it's really hard to find players who are willing to do basically everything defensively for a team while getting little to no touches on the offensive end. Some organizations decided to just slide their power forward down to the center position. The three players that come to mind that probably had the most success at this are Chris Bosh, Pau Gasol, and Tim Duncan. However, most teams aren't fortunate enough to have a 6'11", a 7-footer who was flexible enough to play both the power forward and center position, so for many teams, that really wasn't an option as well. Another experiment, and I would argue the most successful one, was to make the center position a roll man in the pick and roll action, so not only could he continue to score at a high rate, but also keep up his level of efficiency. Two teams that decided to utilize this style of play were the Phoenix Suns with Amari Sotomayor and the Orlando Magic with Dwight Howard. But unfortunately, most centers weren't as athletic as Amari Stoudemire and Dwight Howard, so for the most part, you just had general managers who were drafting extremely tall players because, you know, you can't teach height. And because of that ideology and the refusal to adjust, that thus brings us to the dark ages. Between 2010 and 2015, the center position was at an all-time low. Dwight Howard and Amari Stoudemire were dealing with injuries, so they were not the same players that they were before. Players such as Pau Gasol and Tim Duncan were way past their prime. Shaq was either looking at retirement or already out of the league, which for the first time in NBA history, left the NBA with a massive hole of talent at the center position. During a stretch of years, if you were to ask anyone, who are the top three centers in the NBA, most people would say Dwight Howard, despite the fact that he was injury riddled throughout this entire stretch of years. And after that, it's a toss up between players such as Brooke Lopez, Joe Kim Noah, or God forbid, Roy Hibbert. And for people out there who are unaware of how horrible of a list that would be if that was the top three centers during those stretch of years, let me explain it to you like this. Between 2010 and 2015, there were only three players who had at least one season of 20 points and 10 rebounds. Just three. To put that into context, in 1993, there were six centers who ended that season averaging 20 points and 10 rebounds. Just last year, there were three centers who averaged 20 points and 10 rebounds. And as of right now, there are four centers who are averaging 20 points and 10 rebounds. But there was a bright spot. See, down in Miami, the big three had formed, and despite the fact that many people love to talk about LeBron and Wade, Chris Bosh, in my opinion, made not only one of the biggest sacrifices, but made a step in the right direction in accepting a new role that would aid this team significantly. After getting embarrassed in the 2011 finals, largely because the Dallas Mavericks were able to just play zone defense due to the lack of spacing, Chris Bosh not only became a full-time center, but slowly but surely became a better three-point shooter as well, which gave the Miami Heat a dynamic that really no team in the NBA was prepared for. Because while Chris Bosh was roughly the same height as a lot of centers in the NBA, he still was able to utilize a lot of his advantages that he had at his disposal with his ability to be way quicker than majority of the centers in the league. And once he became even somewhat of a three-point threat, it became extremely hard for coaches to justify leaving a flat-footed seven-footer out there to attempt to close out on a three-point shooter. 
So now with a prominent center stretching out the floor all the way to the three point line, the NBA in the center position quickly evolved into where we are in today's game. And even though the center position is far removed from where it once was in a traditional sense, I would argue that the development in the skill set, as well as the diversity in the playing style has done wonders for the NBA. You have the defensive oriented centers who offensively are pretty inept, especially in the low post. However, they're able to stay efficient and effective through the pick and roll action. Then you had the players in the early 2010s who were forced to make adjustments and now are shooting way more three pointers than they've ever done at any point of their careers. You still have organizations who have players who would traditionally play the power four position, however, slide them down to the five spot to give them a little bit more flexibility and versatility. And then finally, you have this group of very unique centers who have meshed the skill set of some of the new age big men while also keeping some of the old age big men alive as well. And so moving forward, again, despite the fact that the center position is vastly different from where it once was 20 to 30 years ago, I'm actually pretty optimistic on what's next for the five spot. But even with my level of optimism, this still must be said. There's a reason why I haven't talked about MVPs and championships since we left the 90s section. And that's because quite frankly, the center position just hasn't been that dominant nor impactful enough to receive those type of awards. The last center to win an MVP dates all the way back to Shaq in the year 2000. And even since then, there's only been a handful of centers to even finish in the top three in the MVP race. Also, when it comes to championships, Shaq led the Los Angeles Lakers to three rings in the early 2000s, won another ring with the Miami Heat with D-Wade, and then you have Ben Wallace with the Detroit Pistons, but that's really been it as well. Sure, we can talk about potentially Pau Gasol technically being a center with the Los Angeles Lakers and winning two with Kobe, and even Tim Duncan playing more of the center position after David Robinson retired and still winning championships with the San Antonio Spurs. And heck, we can even highlight how Dwight Howard was able to lead his team to the NBA Finals, but I kind of feel like it would be missing the point if I started to lower the bar. The reality is, is that the center position in a league where it's extremely obvious how impactful the three-point line is and how the rules tend to favor perimeter oriented players, big men are just not as impactful as they once were. And it does force us to ask questions such as, can you win a championship in today's league if the best player on your roster is a center? Or will there be a team or a coach that will zig while the rest of the league is zagging? Go against the grain, build a team through the center position, surround him with a bunch of three point shooting and just allow him to feast in the post and hopefully it starts a new trend in the NBA. But regardless of what the future has to hold for the center position, I'm extremely pleased in the evolution of the big men. Where it's at in today's game, how diverse the skill sets are and how so many players and teams are starting to find ways to be impactful at the five position with different personnel around them. And hopefully players like Joel Embiid and Jokic are impactful enough to not only win a couple of MVPs, but potentially lead their teams to the NBA Finals and win some championships. So with that being said, please let me know if you enjoyed the video by hitting the thumbs up and also leaving a comment in the comment section below if you felt like I missed anything. All feedback is great feedback because I don't necessarily know if you all enjoy these type of videos on my channel. If so, please let me know in the comment section below, share the video, hit the thumbs up, and I'll see you all next time. Peace.